Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Kevin Can't Play Today Airlines. Please make sure your trade tables and are in the properly stored in the upright position and your seatbelts are fastened. Welcome and let's fly the unfriendly skies. Uh, so welcome back to our War Thunder documentary. Uh, today we're doing probably one of my favorite planes of all time. Uh, bar none. Uh, the North American B-25 Billy Mitchell. Uh, this was the first plane I ever remember being able to get on in my entire life. I was young. We had one uh, uh, May first grade. We had one come into the airport for a uh, show, and uh, it was uh, one that had been converted to uh, passenger duty, so VIP transport. Um, uh, yeah, I just I mean the the look of the plane and everything just was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. And ever since then, I've continued to love the B-25. Um, I do think it's one of the best uh, designed aircraft of all time. And, uh, yeah, we'll get into that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And uh, here we go. So, uh, yeah, what we have here is a uh, B-25J-20. Uh, one of just a beautiful plane a lot of heavy firepower and here we've got the B-25J-1 which has one less machine gun in the front there and uh, yeah there are a lot of variants to this plane including another one we have in the game which is the uh, PBJ-1H which we'll talk about a little bit later um, this one's got some impressive weaponry as well uh, some extra 50 cals and uh, right here uh, you might see a uh, little oddity and that's a 75 millimeter howitzer mounted in this thing so <laughs> yeah um, another beautiful plane there um, yeah I've always loved this plane um, love the look of it I mean, just look at it from the front here that kind of uh, reverse goal, a unique reverse goal wing design on the, uh, or, uh, uh, what do you call it, angle to the wings. Uh, then we got, you know, the, the bombardier compartment, which has one fixed gun here. Uh, gunner's position here, we can uh, fire that 50 cal. Then in, uh, on the sides each here, you got two more 50s. Also fired by the pilot. You got twin 50s up here in the uh, top turret. Uh, and then you've got two 50s in the waist. And another twin 50 calibers in the tail compartment. Um, so yeah, an amazingly engineered aircraft. Um, almost as many guns as, B7, as a full-size B20, uh, B-17 or B-24. Uh, and it's just mounted in this little twin engine bomber. Uh, one of the other things that made me love the B-25 growing up is that uh, when I was going to middle school, uh, it's Colin Kelly Middle School named after a uh, B-24 pilot, but uh, we had a B-25 propeller, an actual B real B-25 propeller on the side of the school uh, next to the name. To, it was kind of our, because we were the Kelly Bombers. So, uh, that was neat. But anyway, let's uh, let's get to flying one of these and uh, start talking about um, the history of the aircraft. So yeah, let's do this one. Go over to Maui. Yeah, we are carrying three thousand pound bombs in this one. Or not Maui, Oahu. So yeah, three 1,000 pound bombs is, is quite a bit of weaponry. Um, get a flap set. Check our flat, uh, you know, check ailerons. Check rudder. All right, we're good to go. Start reading once we get airborne. We 
which made, oh there we go, finally getting some altitude. You got 3,000 pounds of bombs in your uh, bomb bay, it might take a second to get up there. <laughs> It's a little bit of weight. Alright, All right, we're gonna go on a little bit of strafing around here. There's the tank. We'll go after this ground target first with guns. Alright, target destroyed. Alright, we'll fly over towards uh, Diamond Head here while we gain some altitude. We'll come back from a bo for a bombing run. Once we've done that, all right. Now we're at stable speed. All right, we'll get into the facts. Uh, the North American B-25 Mitchell is a medium bomber that was introduced in 1941, named in honor of Major General William, uh, William Billy Mitchell, uh, pioneer of U.S. Uh, military aviation. Uh, used by many Allied forces, the B-25 served in every theater of World War II, and after the war ended, many remained in surf uh, service, operating across four decades. Uh, produced in numerous variants, uh, nearly uh, 10,000 B-25s were built. Uh, these included a few limited models, such as the uh, F-10 reconnaissance aircraft, the AT-24 crew trainers, and the United States Marine Corps PBJ-1 patrol bomber. Um, as we showed you earlier. Um, in terms of design and development, the uh, Air Corps used a circular uh, number 38-385, in case you're wondering, in March 1938, uh, describing the performance they required from the next bombers, a payload of a minimum of 1,200 pounds with a range of 1,200 miles at more than 200 miles an hour. These uh, performance specifications led North American Aviation to submit their uh, NA-40 design. The uh, single NA-40 built flew uh, at the end of January 1939. It went through several modifications to correct problems. Uh, these improvements included fitting 1600 horsepower Wright R2600 uh, twin cyclone radial engines, which are bright engines in uh, March of 1939, which solved the lack of power. Alright, we're going to come around and make for our bomb target. Now that we're at a decent altitude. In March 1939, North American delivered the uh, substantially redesigned and improved NA-40 to the United States Army Air Corps for evaluation. It was in competition with other manufacturers' designs, but failed to win orders. The aircraft was originally intended to be an attack bomber for export to the United Kingdom and France, both of which had a uh, pressing requirement for such aircraft in the early stages of World War II. Uh, however, the French had already opted for a revised Douglas 7B as the uh, DB7. Unfortunately, the NA40B uh, was destroyed in a crash on the 11th of April 1939 while undergoing testing. Uh, although the crash was not considered due to a fault with the aircraft design, the Army ordered the uh, DB7 as the A20, which was actually a pretty good plane in its own self. How close we're we getting. I uh, might be able to get another paragraph off. Uh, the Air Corps issued a specification for a medium bomber in March of 1939 that was capable of carrying a payload of 2,400 pounds over uh, 1,200 miles at 300 miles an hour. Uh, NAAA, 
right. NAA. We'll uh, get to that. We got a we got a bomb site coming up. Why didn't my bombs drop? Oh, my keyboard must have remapped. Dang it. Alright. Well, that's gonna be a problem. We're gonna have to go do this the old fashioned way. Let me get. Get some distance and we'll swing back around for another pass. I should just drop them one at a time. Uh, North American Aircraft used the NA-40B uh, design to develop the NA-62, uh, which complete, uh, competed for the medium bomber contract. No YB-25 was available for uh, prototype service tests. Uh, in September of 1939, the Air Corps issued the uh, NA-62 into production as the B-25, along with the other new Air Corps uh, medium bomber, the uh, Martin B-26 Marauder, off the drawing board, so without any testing. We'll flip around and try and get, that, get those bombs off. About to commence bombing run. Is it there we are? Follow these down. Going from 6,000 feet, so it's going to take a second. We didn't get it? Ah. Uh. Alright. Oh well. We'll get it with another thing. We got other planes to fly. Uh, the Air Corps issued a specification for a medium bomber in March of 1939 that was cap- Oh wait. Oops, I accidentally uh, doubled that paragraph. <laughs> Early in the B-25 production, NAA incorporated a significant design redesign to the wing dihedral. Uh, the first nine aircraft had a constant dihedral, meaning the wing had a consistent upward angle from the fuselage to the wingtip. Uh, this design caused stability issues, however. Flattening the outer wing panels by giving them a slightly anhedral angle just outboard of the engine nacelles uh, nullified the problem and gave the uh, B-25 its unique uh, goal wing configuration. Less noticeable changes during this period included an increase in the size of the tail fins to decrease their inward tilt at the tops. The uh, NAA continued design and development in 1940 and 1941. Uh, both the B-25A and the B-25B series entered USAF uh, service. The B-25B was operational in 1942. Combat requirements led to further developments before the year was over, NAA was uh, producing the B-25C and B-25D series, uh, which entered uh, oh, sorry, at different plants. Also in 1942, the manufacturer began design work with the Cannon Arm B-25G series. The uh, NA-100 of uh, 1943 and 1944 was an interim armament uh, 
development at the Kansas City complex known as the B-25D2. Uh, similar armament upgrades by the U.S.-based Commercial Modification Center involved about half the B-25G series. For the development led to the B-25H, the B-25J, and the B-25J2. Uh, the gunship design concept dates uh, to late 1942, and NAA sent a field technical representative to the SWPA, uh, which I forget what that stands for. <laughs> the uh, factory produced B-25G entered production uh, during the NA-96 order, followed by the redesigned B-25H gunship. The B-25J reverted to the bomber role, but it too could be outfitted as a strafer with a change in the nose section. Uh, NAA uh, manufactured the greatest number of aircraft in World War II. The first time uh, a company had produced trainers, bombers, and fighters sing uh, simultaneously. The AT-6, the S SNJ Texan, Harvard, uh, B-25 Mitchell, and the P-51 Mustang. Yeah, you see that bridge. You know what we're going to do. And probably completely fail because this is not a little tiny fighter. I don't know if I've actually put anything this big under this bridge. Yeah, we're not gonna make it. Yep, yeah, there goes the tail. <laughs> Oops. Rip that tail right off. Alright, we're gonna take a moment and switch over to the uh, J-20 before I get into the operational history of which there is a lot yeah this uh, this video will probably be pretty long <laughs> all right we'll go to this guy um, what we got in it check real quick uh, we only got 250 pounders in it we haven't unlocked the bigger ones yet oh well Alright, uh, in the Asia-Pacific theater, the majority of B-25s in American service were used in the war against Japan in Asia and uh, the Pacific. The Mitchell fought from the northern Pacific to the south Pacific and the far east. Uh, these areas include the campaigns in the Aleutian Islands, Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands, New Britain, China, Burma, and the Island Hopping Campaign in the Central Pacific. Uh, the aircraft's potential as a ground attack aircraft emerged during the Pacific War. Uh, the jungle environment reduced the usefulness of medium level bombing and made a low level attack the best tactic. Uh, using similar mast height level tactics and skip bombing, the B-25 proved itself to be a capable anti-shipping asset. Uh, where was I? And sank many enemy uh, sea vessels of various types. Ever increasing forward number of firing guns made the B-25 formidable strafing aircraft for island war warfare. War pair. <laughs> the strafer versions were the B-25C1 uh, slash D1, the B-25J1, and the NAA strafer nose, the G J2 series uh, uh, subseries. In Burma, the B-25 was often used to attack Japanese communication links, especially bridges in central uh, Burma. Uh, it also helped supply the besieged troops at Imphal, you know, which I probably am mispronouncing, in 1944. The, uh, hold on a second, we'll go in for this low-level bomb run real quick. All right, we got it that time. <laughs> that was one dead tank. Let's see 
if we can come around for a strafing run. Or if it's too tight. Are we gonna find the little guy? There he is. Boom! Engine shot, first round. Nice! Alright, that was fun. <laughs> the Chinese Air Task Force, uh, the Chinese uh, American Composite Wing, the 1st Air Commando Group, the uh, 341st Bomb Group, and eventually the relocated 12th Bomb Group all operated the B-25 in, Ch in the uh, Chinese uh, Burma-India Theater. Uh, many of these missions involved uh, battlefield isolation, interdiction, and close air support. Later in the war, the USAAF uh, acquired bases in other parts of the Pacific. The Mitchell could strike targets in Indochina, Formosa, and Kyushu, uh, increasing the usefulness of the B-25. It was also used in some of the shortest raids of the Pacific War, striking from Saipan against Guam and Tinian. The 41st uh, Bomb Group used uh, it against the Pacific off uh, ja against the <laughs> Japanese occupied islands that had been bypassed in the main campaign, such as the uh, happening in the Marshall Islands. Uh, one second, I get some coffee. All right. Uh, the first B twenty fives. Oh, just tell you what we're talking about. <laughs> the in the Middle East and Italy. Uh, the first B-25s arrived in Egypt and were carrying out independent operations by October of 1942. Operations there against Axis airfields and motorized vehicle columns spurred the ground actions of the Second Battle of El Alamein. But you didn't think you'd see a bomber do many barrel rolls. But this one can. It was powerful twin engines, man. The thing flies like a fighter. Uh... Therefore, the aircraft took part in the rest of the campaign in North Africa, the invasion of Sicily, and the advance up Italy. The Strait of Messina to the Aegean in the Strait of Messina to the Aegean Sea, the B-25 conducted sea sweeps uh, as part of the coastal air forces. In Italy, the B-25 was used in a ground attack role concentrating on uh, attacks against road and rail links in Italy, Australia, and the Balkans. The B-25 had a longer range than the Douglas A-20 Havoc and the Douglas A-26 Invader, allowing it to reach uh, further into occupied Europe. Occupied. Words are hard. <laughs> the five bombardment groups, 20 squadrons, of the 9th and 12th Air Forces that used the B-25 in the Mediterranean Theater of Operations were the only U.S. units to employ the B-25 in Europe. Uh, in terms of the rest of the Europe, uh, the R RAF received uh, nearly 900 Mitchells, using them to replace the Douglas Bostons, Lockheed Venturas, and Vickers Wellington bombers. Uh, the Mitchell entered active RAF service on the 22nd of January 1943. At first, it was used to bomb targets in occupied Europe. After the Normandy invasion, the uh, RAF and France used Mitchells in support of the Allies in Europe. Uh, several squadrons moved to forward air bases on the continent. Uh, the USAF did not use the B-25 in combat in the European Theater of Operations, just our allies. Uh, in its role under the USAAF, however, the B-25B first gained fame as the bomber used in the uh, April 18, 1942 Doolittle Raid, uh, in which 16 B-25Bs, led by Lieutenant Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle, uh, attacked mainland Japan four months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Uh, the mission gave a much-needed lift in spirits to the Americans uh, and alarmed the Japanese, who had believed their home islands to be inviolable by enemy forces, especially at that time in the war. Uh, although the amount of actual damage done was relatively minor, it forced uh, the Japanese to divert troops uh, for the home defense for the remainder of the war. Uh, the Raiders took off from the uh, carrier USS Hornet 
and successfully bombed Tokyo and four other Japanese cities without loss. Uh, Fifteen of the bombers subsequently crash-landed en route to recovery fields in eastern China. These losses were the result of the task force being spotted by a Japanese vessel, forcing the bombers to take off 170 miles uh, early. Fuel exhaustion, stormy uh, nighttime conditions with zero visibility, and lack of electronic homing aids as the, uh, at the recovery bases. Only one B-25 uh, bomber landed intact in Siberia, where its five-man crew was interned and the uh, aircraft confiscated. Of the 70 air, or 80 air crew, 69 survived their historic mission and eventually made it back to American lines. Although the B-25 was originally designed to bomb from uh, medium altitudes and level flight, it was frequently used in the Southwest uh, Pacific Theater in treetop level strafing and missions with parachute retarded fragmentation bombs against Japanese airfields. Uh, in New Guinea and the Philippines. These heavily armed Mitchells were field modified at Townsville, Australia under the direction of Major uh, Paul I. Pappy Gunn and uh, North American Technical Representative Jack Fox. These uh, commerce destroyers were also used on strafing and skip bombing missions against Japanese shipping trying to re resupply their armies. Uh, under the leadership of Lieutenant General George C. Kennedy, or Kenny, not Kennedy, <laughs> uh, missiles of the Far East Air Forces and its existing components, the 5th and 13th Air Forces, uh, lost my spot, Devastated Japanese targets in the Northwest Pacific Theater during 1944 to 1945. Uh, the USAF played a significant role in pushing the Japanese back to their home islands. The uh, type operated with the with great effect in the Central Pacific, Alaska, uh, North Africa, Mediterranean, and Chinese uh, China, Burma, India theaters. The uh, USAF Sub Anti-Submarine Command made great use of the B-25 in 1942 and 1943. Some of the earliest B-25 bomb groups also flew the Mitchell on coastal patrols after the Pearl Harbor attack prior to the uh, AAF-AAC organization. Uh, many of the two or so submarine squadrons or anti-submarine squadrons flew the B-25C, D, and G series in the American theater, uh, anti-submarine, nope, oh, we're, that's too far apparently. Hold on, gotta turn around, get over this. Alright, back on the map apparently. <laughs> apparently you can't fly all the way around the island. <laughs> uh, Often this distinctive white sea surge camouflage. Alright, so where are we here? I think we will go land and change planes. Uh, combat developments in the uh, Army Air Corps uh, used as a gunship. In anti shipping operations, the USAF had urgent need for hard hitting. Aircraft, the North American responded with the B 25G. In this series, the transparent nose and bombardier navigator positions was changed for a shorter hatched nose with, a, with two fixed 50 caliber machine guns and a manually loaded 25 or 75 millimeter M4 cannon, one of the largest weapons fitted to an aircraft. Similar to the uh, British uh, 57 millimeter gun armed Mosquito. Mark 18 and the auto loading German 75mm long barrel board cannon BK 75 heavy caliber ordnance fitted to both the uh, Henschel HS 129Bs or B3 and the uh, Junkers JU 88P1. 
The B-25 shorter nose placed the cannon breech behind the pilot where it could be manually loaded and serviced by the navigator. His uh, crew station was moved to a position just behind the pilot. The navigator signaled the pilot when the gun was ready and the pilot fired the weapon using a button on his control wheel. The uh, Actually, let's go into the cockpit real quick. Yeah, there we go. There's the view from the pilot in flight. We'll take a good look around once we get into the uh, uh, PBJ. The H series uh, normally came from a f from the factory mounting uh, four fixed, four firing 50 caliber machine guns in the nose, uh, four and a pair of under cockpit conformal flank mount gun pod packages. You know, right on either side of the cockpit. Uh, two more in the uh, manned dorsal turret, relocated forward to a position just behind the cockpit, which is where you see it in the planes I have in the game here. Um, as that became standard for the J Plus models. Uh, one in each pair of new waist positions. Also, new to the uh, J variants and beyond. And lastly, a pair of guns in the new uh, tail gunner's position. Which, again, all these were new to the uh, J model. Sorry, I'm getting ready for landing, so that takes a little bit of concentration. angle is not the best. This is a very short runway, so I gotta try and reduce speed as much as possible. So that was actually a pretty, a little rough, but pretty darn good landing. Alright, let's get out of here. And actually get into the uh, <coughs> H-Series, which was redesignated to the PBJs for the Marine Corps. So this is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful plane, which also has eight 250 pound uh, bombs in it, so it could still actually carry a good amount of bombs. Alright, let's go. Um, Let's take a look at the front here. So you'll see the uh oh. no 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 brakes 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 brakes. That was not intended. Um so you've got the uh eight forward mounted there. Uh ten if you uh include the top turret. Uh, company promotional material bragged that the B-25H could bring 10 machine it could quote bring to bear 10 machine guns coming and foregoing in addition to the 75 millimeter cannon, eight rockets, and 3,000 pounds of bombs. And we have a bomb loadout in this one because I'm not a big fan of rockets. But uh, yeah, I want you guys to so I'm gonna put on full break and uh, fire off the big gun. And show you what happens when that when that goes off. 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, that bounced the plane up a little bit. And uh, now we're going to do it without brakes. You'll see the plane actually turns with the force of that. Alright, we're going to let it reload for a minute because I want full load of that cannon. Yeah, well, since we're here, we'll go and look at the cockpit a bit. Co oops. Uh, reload a little faster than I expected. Yeah, there's a co-pilot. Unfortunately, this is kind of a this is still a placeholder cockpit. They don't have it fully uh, fleshed out, so you don't see the uh, trigger for the massive cannon right there. But you get kind of an idea of the layout. Um, and yeah, so we'll get we'll get up going in the air. I forgot how heavy this one was. <laughs> this was very heavy. We're going to use all the runway to get up in the air with a full bomb load. And that big 75mm cannon up in there. Get up to some altitude here. Uh, the H had a modified cockpit with a single flight controls operated by the pilot. The co-pilot station and controls were deleted, which is not shown in our model here because they haven't finished that cockpit. Um, and instead had a smaller seat used by the navigator cannoneer. And the radio operator crew position was aft the bomb bay uh, with access to the waste guns. Factory production totals were uh, 405 B-25Gs and 1,000 uh, B-25Hs, with 248 of the latter being used by the Navy and Marine Corps as P uh, PBJ-1Hs, which we are currently sitting in. Uh, elimination of the co-pilot saved weight, moving the dorsal, uh, dorsal turret forward, counterbalanced in part the waste guns and the manned uh, rear turret. Let's come around for that. For a run, coming about. Now, if you're curious, on the uh, tip of the right wing, that's a uh, radar pod. If you were wondering what that is, gives a uh, better uh, night radar services. And good, uh, more uh, accurate anti-submarine patrolling. How far out are we? Uh, we got ways. Uh, so the return to a medium bomber. Uh, following the two gunship series, NAA again produced the medium bomber configuration with the B-25J series. Uh, it op optimized the mix of the interim NA-100 and the H series having both the bombardier station and fixed guns of the D and the forward turret and re, uh, refined armament of the H series. Destroy it though. We're gonna come back around. Come back around for that one. Got some good hits on it, though. You know, we just nuked that half track.
Going for another strafing pass on that. Tank. Yeah, if you can't tell, this plane is very agile for its uh, for its size. Um, one of the things I love so much about it, especially playing it in game. Very tough, very forgiving. Kind of hard to stay on target with that cannon. <laughs> but we put some good hits into it. Give it one more run. I think we still got some cannon left. I don't have too many rounds for that uh, 75 millimeter. Boom, target destroyed. With a 75 millimeter cannon and a bunch of 50 caliber machine guns, yeah, I can pretty much shred a light tank. And even some medium tanks. If you get a good shot. Alright, back to reading. <laughs> we'll go, yeah, we'll head west this time. See what we can. Or we'll go up the valley. We'll go up the valley. The uh, saddle, as it's sometimes referred to. Um, where were we? Ah. Uh, North American Aircraft also produced a strafer nose, first shipped to Air Depots as kits, then introduced on the production line in alternating blocks with the Bombardier nose. The solid metal strafer nose housed eight center line uh, Browning M2 50 caliber machine guns. The remainder of the armament was that uh, was as in the H5. Uh, uh, North American also supplied kits to mount eight underwing high-velocity airborne rockets, uh, HVARs, just outside the propeller arcs. These were mounted on launch rails four to a wing. Uh, the final and most built series of the Mitchell, the B-25J, looked less like earlier series apart from the well-glazed bombardier's nose of uh, nearly identical appearance to the earliest B-25 subtypes. Instead, the J uh, followed the overall configuration of the H-Series from the cockpit aft. It had the uh, forward, uh, forward dorsal turret and other armament and airframe advancements. All J models included four 50 caliber uh, light barrel Browning AN-M2 machine guns uh, in a pair of fuselage packages, conformal gun pods, each flanking the lower cockpit. Each pod contained two Browning uh, M2s. The uh, J-Series restored the co-pilot uh, co seats and dual flight controls. The factory made available kits to the air de depot system to create the strafer nose uh, B-25J2. Uh, this configuration carried a total of 18 yeah, 18 uh, in uh, 18 50 caliber uh, AM2 Browning M2 machine guns, eight in the nose, four in the flank mount conformal gun pod packages, two in the dorsal turret, uh, one each of the uh, in the pair of waist positions, and a pair of the tail, with 14 guns either are aimed directly forward or aimed to fire directly forward for strafing missions. Uh, some aircraft had eight five inch high velocity aircraft rockets. Uh, total J-Series production was 4,318 aircraft. Uh, flight characteristics. The B-25 was safe and forgiving to fly. Uh, with one engine out, 60 degree banking turns into the dead engine were possible, and control w could be uh, easily maintained down to 145 miles an hour. Uh, the pilot had to remember the, uh, to maintain engine out directional control at low speeds after takeoff with rudder. Uh, if this maneuver were attempted with ailerons, the aircraft would snap out of control. Um, 
but otherwise you could manage to take off with only one engine. Uh, the tricycle landing gear made for uh, excellent visibility while taxiing. The uh, only significant complaint about the B-25 was the extremely high noise level uh, produced by its engines. As a result, many pilots eventually suffered from varying degrees of hearing loss. As those big engines with the propellers right next to you, uh, yeah, were a little noisy. Uh, in terms of durability, the Mitchell was an extremely sturdy aircraft that could withstand tremendous punishment. One B-25C of the uh, 321st Bomb Group was nicknamed Patches because its crew chief painted all of the aircraft's flak hole patches with the bright yellow zinc chromate primer. By the end of the war, the uh, aircraft had completed over 300... Yes, 100 missions had been belly landed six times and had over 400 patched holes. Uh, some of those were, and that's not including the re-patches. The airframe of patches was so distorted from battle damage that uh, straight at level flight required 8 degrees of left aileron trim and 6 degrees of right rudder causing the air to crab sideways across the sky. But that's pretty impressive. <laughs> and the flight crew that continue that can continue to fly that thing over and over and over again, even with the uh, degrees of damage. Yeah, pretty cool. Alright. On to its role in the U.S. Navy and USMC. The U.S. Navy, uh, well, hold on, let me get, grab some coffee, my throat's getting a little dry. Alright, there we go. Uh, the U.S. Navy designation for the Mitchell was the PBJ-1, and apart from increased use of radar, uh, it was configured like its Army Air Force counterparts. Uh... Under the pre-1962 USN, USMC, USCG aircraft designation system, uh, PBJ-1 stood for Patrol P. Oh, we're leaving the battlefield again. This will be a hard climb over this mountain. Thankfully, I think this old girl can do it without stalling. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, what the heck, we'll head for that highest peak. Uh, okay, so where were we? Oh yeah, PJ, uh, the P stood for patrol, B for bomber, and built by North American Aviation, J. Uh, as each of its each uh, manufacturer had its own um, alphabetical designation, uh, with the first variant, the one uh, under the existing American Naval Aircraft Designation Systems of the era, the first PBJ-1 arrived in February of 1943. Uh, and nearly all reached the United States Marine Corps squ uh, squadrons, uh, beginning with the Marine Bombing Squadron uh, 413, or VMB 413. Following the AAFAC format, the uh, Marine Mitchells had search radar and retractable radome, uh, replacing the remotely operated ventral turrets. Later D and J series had uh, nose-mounted APS-3 radar, and later still J and H series had uh, mounted radar in the starboard wingtip, as you see in this one. Um, dark. Where were we? Um, there we are. The large quantities of B-25 H and J series became known as the. Uh, PBJ-1H and PBJ-1J, respectively. These aircraft op uh, often operate along with earlier B-25J series in Marine Squadrons. 
Uh, the B20, the PBJ were uh, operated almost exclusively by the Marine Corps as land-based bombers to operate them. The uh, U.S. Marine Corps established a number of Marine bomber squadrons, VMBs, beginning with the VMB-13 in March 1943 at MCAS Cherry Point, North Carolina. Eight VMB squadrons were flying PBJs by the end of 1943, forming the initial Marine medium bomber uh, bombardment group. Uh, operational use of the Marine Corps PBJ-1s began in uh, 19, March of 1944. The Marine PBJs operated from the Philippines, Saipan, uh, Saipan, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa during the first few months of the Pacific War, or during the last few months. Yeah, that was weird. I was wondering why that didn't sound right. <laughs> Their primary mission was the long-range interdiction of enemy shipping, trying to run the blockade, which was strangling Japan. The weapon of choice during these missions was usually the 5-inch H4 rocket, eight of which could be carried. Some VMB-612 uh, intruder PB-1 or PBJ-1Ds and J-series planes flew without top turrets to save weight and increase range on night patrols. Uh, especially towards the end of the war where uh, air superiority existed and they weren't too terrible worried about Japanese fighters. Uh, during the war, the Navy tested the Cannon Arm G series and conducted carrier trials with, H, with an H equipped with uh, arresting gear. After uh, World War II, some PBJs stationed at the Navy's then rocket laboratory site in... Uh, Oh, I'm probably going to butcher this one. Inyokern? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's pronounced Inyokern, California. Site of the present-day Naval Air uh, Weapons Station, China Lake. Tested various air-to-ground rockets and arrangements. One arrangement was a twin-barrel nose arrangement that could fire uh, 10 spin-stabilized 5-inch rockets in one salvo. God, imagine that. Like a giant chain gun. Uh, two giant chain guns in the nose. Firing rockets. Alright, one second. Ah. Alright, and in its use in the Soviet Air Force, the U.S. supplied 862 B-25s, uh, B, D, G, and J types to the uh, Soviet Union under lend -Lease during World War II via the Alaska-Siberian ALSIB ferry routes. Other damaged aircraft arrived or crashed in the far east of Russia, and one Doolittle raid aircraft landed there short of fuel after attacking Japan. Uh, the lone airworthy aircraft to reach the Soviet Union was lost in a hangar fire in the early 1950s while undergoing routine maintenance. In general, the B-25 was operated as a ground support and tactical daylight bomber, as similar uh, Douglas A-20 Havocs were used. It saw action in flights from uh, Stalingrad with B and D models to the German surrender during uh, May of 1945 with G and J pro uh, types, not prototypes. The B-25s that remained in Soviet Air Force service after the war were assigned the NATO reporting name Bank. Uh, China, as uh, well over 100 B-25 Cs and Ds were supplied to the Nationalist Chinese during the Second Sino-Japanese War. Uh, in addition, uh, the total a total of 131 B-25Js were supplied to China under Lend-Lease. Uh, the four squadrons of the 1st BG, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th of the 1st Medium Bomb Group were formed during the war. They uh, formerly operate, formerly, not formally, operated Russian-built Tupolev SB bombers, uh, then transferred to the B-25. Uh, the 1st BG was under the command of Chinese-American Composite Wing uh, while operating the B-25s. Following the end of the war in the Pacific, uh, these four bombardment squadrons uh, were established to fight against the communist insurgency that was rapidly spreading throughout the country. And one could wish they had succeeded. 
<coughs> a little bit better, and uh, China would be a different place today. Uh, during the Chinese Civil War, Chinese Mitchells fought alongside the Haviland Mosquitoes. In uh, December of 1948, the Nationalists were forced to retreat to the island of uh, Taiwan, uh, taking many of their Mitchells with them. However, some B-25s were left behind and were pressed into service with the Air Force of the new uh, People's Republic of China. One second, got a little tickle. <coughs> Alright, uh, other operators. Argentina, Australia, Bolivia, Brazil, Canada, Chile, Colombia, uh, Cuba, Dominican Republic, France, Indonesia, with the last operational B-25 in the world, retired from Indonesian Air Service in 1979. Uh, that's quite a long lifespan for a uh, long service lifespan there. Yeah, 1979. Introduced in 42, retired in 79. That's, that's quite a long time for an aircraft to remain in in uh, constant service. Uh, also served in, the, in Mexico, Netherlands, Peru, Poland, Spain, United Kingdom, Uruguay, and Venezuela. A very popular aircraft. Um, there were a couple major incidents involving uh, the B-25. Some terribly tragic accidents as we fly over Diamond Head which I've been to this tippy-top point of once upon a time when I was much, much younger. Uh, at 9.40 on Saturday, uh, the 28th of July, 1945, and that's 9.40 in the morning, a USAF B-25D crashed in thick fog into the north side of the Empire State Building between the 79th and 80th floors. Uh, 14 people died, 11 in the building, and the three occupants of the aircraft, including the pilot, Colonel William F. Smith, uh, Betty Lou Oliver, uh, elevator attendant, survived the imp impact and the subsequent fall of the elevator cage 75 stories to the basement. That's a hell of a survival story. Uh, the average uh, story in a building like that is 10 feet. Uh, that's 750 feet. That's a fall of 750 feet in a small elevator cage. Um, thankfully, it probably had a braking system to uh, help slow that fall, but still, that's pretty amazing that she survived through that. And then uh, uh, French General Philippe Leclerc was aboard his B, his uh, North American B-25 Mitchell, the Tali, uh, Tai? Tali? I don't know how he would pronounce it in French, uh, despite having taken French. When it uh, crashed near uh, Colombe Béchard in French Algeria on the 28th of November 1947, killing everyone on board. Get our landing approach here. Then we'll get on to surviving aircraft. So, if you're interested in this plane, like I am, and you've never gotten to see one in person, uh, and would like to, well, you're in luck. There are uh, a surprisingly large number of these aircraft still... Uh, still around uh, in various uh, conditions. Let's get landed here and I will speak to you more about that. Come on, need to lose some airspeed. There we go. Now that was butter. <laughs> Completely greased that landing.
yeah, so yeah, you're in luck. Uh, in the U.S., there are 16 in storage and under restoration, a whole 28 on display, and a whopping 43 airworthy B-25s of all models. Uh, and that's just in the U.S. Uh, six are in storage or under restoration, 22 are on display, and three are airworthy and uh, elsewhere uh, from Great Britain to uh, Russia and New Zealand. Uh, I think there's some in France. Uh, so yeah, if, if, you've, if you want to go see a B-25, there's a good chance that you will be able to find one fairly close to you. I believe we have one in our state. There are one or two in our state, even. Uh, so if you're in Oregon, head up to the uh, Tillamook Air Museum or the McMinnville Air Museum, and um, I think we have one in each of those uh, museums. Or if you're in uh, Washington, you can head down to McMinnville. Um, I don't think there's one near Seattle as you get more Boeing stuff up there, but you might be in luck there. Either way, you know, there's a lot around. But anyway, we've already run an hour, and uh, even though I can say a lot, sing a lot more praises for this beautiful and amazing piece of equipment, um, an hour is a pretty good amount of time to be uh, uh, to be going. So, um, go back to the hangar, and I will see you next time. Again, yeah, my potatoes up and running again, so some of my lost scripts are now. Um, accessible, including this one, which I was looking forward to. And I think next time we might do another uh, North American aircraft, uh, also probably my favorite airplane of all time. And so you'll have to uh, stick around and wait and see which one that is. And uh, thank you again for joining me. And until next time, <laughs> come with me to fly the unfriendly skies.